So in the last lesson, we sort of looked at Korea's uh, arrival of democracy. <coughs> we looked at what happened from 1980 and then up to 1987. We noticed that uh, for a lot of Korea's move to democracy, it was about collective action, that there was a tipping point in the democratic movement when a mass of people got involved. So what we saw in 1980 in Gwangju, we see this intersection between daily life and politics, where some people are heavily active, some people are engaged in politics, other people just want to live their lives, to earn money, uh, to eat, to feed their children, and, and, and they're doing quite well. The country is growing, the country is getting rich, so this focus on democracy and human rights isn't as important to them. But to some groups it was, to students it was, uh, to reporters and journalists it was, uh, to some women, uh, women groups it was, to Christians it was, and they all had different reasons and they all had different figureheads. But it was when all of these different groups came together and it was when all these groups came together and they had singular, uh, I, I'm not sure if figurehead is the right word, but when they had a single person behind whom that they could rally, whether it was Park Jong Chol, Lee Han Yol, these figures that represented uh, the movement, they were a manifestation and also they were martyrs for the movement. And that's what brings South Korea towards democracy, mass collective action, relatively peaceful in the grand scheme of things, of course not entirely peaceful, um, but the, it's achieved through mass participation and the military dictators step aside. Uh, military rule sort of continues with no Teo, but we're slowly entering Korean democracy there from 1987 onwards. With the arrival of Korean democracy, we get this thing, the arrival of Hallyu. So today we're going to sort of have a look at Hallyu and how that works. I, I'm jumping forward a little bit, but based on your presentations and your conversations with me, it seems like, well, why don't we do something like this as part of the course? Um, the, the arrival of Hallyu is important because during the, the 70s and 80s, these things were largely restricted. Um, there's the story of Shin Jung Hyun, a uh, South Korean sort of guitarist, rock and roll man, refusing to put songs for Park Chung Hee on his albums. You had to have a song on your album dedicated to the nation. And most artists just went, yeah, okay, I want to release my album, so I'll put a We Love Korea, Kati Fighting, Seo Mao Lundong, Let's Build It Together song on the album. Some artists refused to do this. Uh, were heavily punished, jailed, uh, tortured for their things. So it wasn't a free society. There was no free art. Of course, there was art being produced in terms of movies and dramas and things, but it was heavily controlled. The arrival of democracy allows more freedom for the arts to flourish. And it's a step-by-step -step process. And I'm sure if you've taken sort of Hallyu classes or things like that before, some of these steps and processes are um, well known to you. The journey from Winter Sonata to Itaewon class, the journey from Soteji uh, to Blackpink, how that all plays out. When I look at the current success of Hallyu, and Hallyu's success is real, right? it's absolutely real. When I look at the current success of Korean movies, dramas, beauty, music, all of these things, it's incredibly real. And Korea's cultural output has probably never been higher. Like the brand K is actually genuinely cool right now. Right? I, I often think of the song Dynamite by BTS, which is written by an English guy called Dave Stewart on a laptop in his bedroom. If he puts that out, it's not popular. No one's going to like it. You put something Korean on the front, you put BTS, one of the world's biggest groups, becomes popular. The label is cool. How did it become cool? And interesting to me, teaching Hallyu to international and domestic students, the international students like it more than domestic students. I can teach a class of 20 Korean young undergraduates and I say, do you like, Korea, do you like k pop? And they'll be like, no. Nah. I can teach international students, do you like k pop? They'll be like, yeah. That's weird to me. 
I can ask Korean students, do you watch K-dramas? They're like, nah, I'm watching Friends, David. Really? You're watching Friends? Mm -hmm. but they are. They're on Netflix and they're watching all of these things. I'll ask international students, do you like Korean dramas? And they'll say yes. So why does this happen? Obviously, it's not true for everybody. There are Koreans that like K-pop and there are international people that don't like, but it's something that I've noticed. And I, I'm trying to explore why that is the case. I was speaking to a uh, master's student in Korean studies, Leslie Hickman. She came and spoke to my class uh, last Wednesday. And she said that the values that she associates with uh, Hallyu are progressive, liberal. And if you ask Korean students, like, what kind of values do you associate with K-pop and things like that, they'll be like, oh, it's really conservative, it's bore, you know. There's completely different perceptions of these things, but it's still one entity. So I'm trying to find out why this happens. My research that I've done, I presented my research at a conference on this with um, Ambassador Anna Park, the South Korean ambassador to the United Kingdom a couple of weeks ago. I believe my research will be published in a book by Routledge. Some of, it gains a lot of attention. Some people like my work, some people don't like my work, right? So some people are like, really like, David, your work is so got that wrong, and they get very angry and visceral with me. And other people are like, yeah, this is really exactly right. So I've noticed it divides opinions a lot. So I'm aware of that. My work uses postmodernism to try to understand Hallyu. It doesn't use postmodernism because I think postmodernism is necessarily correct or it's right, but I use it as a tool to see if it can explain what we're experiencing. So it's not saying that we are postmodern or we should be postmodern. It's saying, does postmodernism help explain what we are seeing right now with Hallyu? So does it have explanatory power? As a tool, is it a good device? Is it a good framework to understand this? So that's what you first have to understand in my using postmodernism. Does it have analytical power? Whenever you look at something, it's very important to say, well, how am I looking at it? Am I taking an economic lens? Am I taking a psychological lens, a cultural lens, a sociological lens, an ethnic lens, and such forth? Identify your lens. So if we take a postmodern approach, then we have the very difficult question of what is postmodernism? Jenny. F. Postmodernism. Yeah. Oh, okay, so yeah. Thank you. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Post Malone's brother, maybe. Uh, Stella has her hand up. Yep. Well, you're addressing, a f you're addressing a few things here, Stella, which is important. Postmodernism first is, is a reaction. It comes after modernism. So we have traditional, we have modern, then we have postmodern. That's the general linear thing. Of course, it manifests differently in literature, in architecture, uh, in sociological thought and such forth, right? So it's not always the same thing. But then you're asking the question importantly, is postmodernism a develop? Is it still modernism, but just a development of it? Right? Is it evolutionary? Is it revolutionary? Is it a completely new paradigm? Or is it still an extension of modernism? 
right? So that's something. We also get this idea that does postmodernity ever come? Is it always this kind of future, but it's like tomorrow? It's never tomorrow, it's always today. Is postmodernism an idea that we never actually get to? That kind of thing that they associate with, um, I want to say quantum mechanics, which I believe is correct, where they say if you, uh, if you can explain quantum mechanics, you don't really understand it. It's like that paradox. So, speak loud. Yeah, absolutely. So Dada is the element where you would take sort of uh, words from a page and you would scramble them all up and you would make a new poem just by randomizing the elements of the text, right? That would be sort of Dada poems, Dada art. This is kind of fun to play with. You can get some really good things. Uh, get, a, get a section of text, get a section of your textbook, copy it and paste into a Dada generator and press like Dada and it will create some of these beautiful, you look at that and you go, wow, man, that's really deep. But it's not, it's just randomizing the words and creating these new things that you've never consciously thought of before. So it sort of, uh, it does things that we're not able consciously to do. We would never consciously sort of say, um, yellow sausage elevator. We might do, I don't know, there might be, a th but Dada would produce a sentence that says yellow sausage elevator, right? Alexandra. Could you actually like provide a definition? Yeah. Okay, modernism. I, I, can, I can give some ideas, right? So, and, and I am going to try to explain them here, by the way. This is not just an open-ended question. I'm going to try to give you an understanding of it. So, um, the explanation of modernism comes a little bit later, but uh, Max Weber, the German sociologist, he looked at modernism, for example, this is one perspective, and he says that modernism is, is composed of many things. One is bureaucracy. So in a modern society, you can go from the East Coast to the West Coast and you, your driving license still works and you can use the same ID card and you can, you're still registered to pay tax. That's an element of modernism, right? So in, in traditional societies, if you go to the other side of the, the country or things like that, you have to start again, you have to start anew, you're starting this new life. In a modern society, bureaucracy connects everything. This was something that Kafka was looking into with his work, right? How bureaucracy becomes this impenetrable beast, but it's a feature of modernity. Weber also was like introducing this idea that modernity is ideational, right? Modernity is not just smartphones and subways and Starbucks and Wi-Fi. Modernity is an idea. Modernity is one that has democratic, egalitarian traditions. It's focused on... Let me go through this and I think it will be easier if I do this, right? So I'm going to try to highlight a couple of concepts that are key in postmodernity. This is the first one, right, which you'll find in Foucault with his work on episteme or Thomas Kuhn's paradigm shifts. Now, I sometimes ask my South Korean students this interesting question. Like, do you and your grandmother have different opinions about social stuff? And they're like, yeah. Is it because your grandmother's a bad person? And they're like, no. So why do you have different ideas? And they're like, oh, my grandmother's wrong. Like, how do you answer this question that different generations have different ideas about different things. Is it because some people are just wrong? Or are there other ways to try to explain this? Well, different generations, and again, like, so Foucault would call this episteme, Kuhn would call it a paradigm. In certain generations, there are words and values and concepts that we know that mean something. For our generations, rainbows, unicorns, candles. They have certain meanings and connotations that we can all perhaps understand that other generations cannot. 
or that they might see them completely differently. Paradigm shifts happen in society. Now, you could imagine that two people, and these paradigm shifts, yeah, it could be, it could be the development of a smartphone, but then the student and the grandmother are both using smartphones. So it can be technological that causes these paradigm shifts. It can be a revolutionary, like the internet, the smartphone, the VCR. That's totally true. And then you get this idea that generations struggle to adapt to the new technology and it creates uh, generation gaps technologically. But it can also be ideational because you could have two people living physically next to each other like in apartment 101 and apartment 103, they could be living physically next to each other in the same apartment. But ideationally, conceptually, they could be living in two different worlds. And the signs and symbols and things that they see mean different things to them. And therefore, it becomes hard for them to communicate or to... Uh, engage in discourse across that paradigm. They don't understand each other. They're there physically, but ideationally, they're removed. And that's because new ideas or technology, they enter a new world. Some people or groups enter this new world more quickly than others, right? So if you look at business, you get these early adapters and these kind of blue ocean people and things like that. Young people are more likely to uh, engage with and adapt and accept and play with and discuss new ideas more than old people. Everyone has a different sort of political inclination as well. Some people are naturally conservative, some people are naturally progressive, some people are extrovert, some people are introvert. We all have different ways of dealing with new things that we face in life. Some people accept these ideas more quickly than others and therefore they start entering this new way of seeing the world. Other people don't, other people do it more slowly, step by step. So one of the first things that I want to try to introduce about postmodernism is that physically we all might be in the same world, ideationally or conceptually, people might be inhabiting different worlds because some people have embraced new ideas and other people have either yet to embrace those ideas or rejected those ideas. This is to say nothing about the ideas themselves. This would be the first point. This would be one of three, perhaps. The first one. The second one is about the idea of truth. So in a modern society, you know the parable of the blind men and the elephant. What's that? I saw some and, well, the blindfolded men. And one of them is holding the trunk and says, ah, oh, this is definitely a snake. Like I'm using my empirical and rational understanding to determine what this thing is and it's a snake. And the other person's holding the leg and is like, man, this is a tree. The other person is holding, touching the elephant's uh, body, saying this is a wall. They're all wrong. They're all incorrect. It's not a tree, it's not a wall, it's not a snake, and they're all using their own empirical and rational things, right? But they're all wrong. However, if they were to combine all of their information, they would achieve the correct answer. So the, pr the, the way to approach the truth is through the accumulation of knowledge and information. You accumulate, so why did we get that wrong? It's because we didn't have enough information. We weren't smart enough. It's not that our process was wrong. It's that we didn't have enough available information. This is something that you might kind of look into with um, sort of the Soviet Union and things like this, these huge bureaucracies where they're gonna try to learn how many kilometers a taxi driver drives each day and then give him enough fuel for that, but no more and no less. And it's like, if we have exactly the right information for whole of society, we can control it and understand it mechanically. Modern society is based around this. And there is a single truth. The various truths don't contradict each other. They're all wrong. 
but you put them all together and there is one single truth that is achieved by uh, gathering the information. So there is a process and there is a belief in that process. Postmodernity, postmodernism, would say that there is no singular truth. There is not one thing. Moreover, not only is there not a singular truth, so this is where we sort of get Derrida and Dada and interpretations, it's all subjective man. Not only is there not a single truth, but the truths can contradict each other. The truths can contradict each other. So something can be both this and this at the same time. Stella, is your hand up? In terms of modern art, you mean? Yeah, absolutely. You, you'll find a lot of that in modern art, right? So whether we get this kind of uh, just a, a wall of red paint or something like this, you get Damien Hirst cutting sharks in half and things like this. Yeah, a lot of modern art is, is like that. And it's described as modern art. I agree. Truths contradict each other. So when there are two contradictory truths, how do you resolve that situation? One truth will win and another truth will lose. Modernity will say, well, there is an answer to this conflict. It's just about engage, uh, embracing more information and knowledge. Postmodernity will say, no, there are two different opposing truths here. One will win and one will lose. It's not about we find a different truth but the truths become engaged in conflict with each other. You will get people suggesting that this then introduces ideas of power, hegemony, Gramsci, and such forth. But this is perhaps the second one, the idea of a truth. In postmodernity, truth changes. Truth becomes subjective, contradictory truths exist. Something can be both A and one, not A and B. A and one, right? They can be different. <coughs> How does that happen? Well, this is perhaps one of Marx's most famous uh, statements, and this is the big challenge to liberalism. Liberalism, the ideas of people like J.S. Mill in the uh, 1800s, who said that because we all have the capacity for rational thought, we are all equal. This was the argument that was used to give women the vote in the United Kingdom. Because we all have capacity for rational thought, this is what defines us. Our consciousness or our ability to be conscious is that what defines us as humans. Not physical characteristics, nothing else, but this kind of ability that we perceive in here. It's really interesting to ask Korean people, where is your mind? You always go here. I'm not sure if it's linguistic whether it's cultural. Marx said that, one of the big points from Marxism that, that plays a, a long part in this, is that we actually think differently. We don't all think the same. Our environment affects how we think. Our social being, our class, our gender, our ethnicity, affects our consciousness. So, Marx's idea was that we will think differently. To assume that everybody thinks the same is a lovely idea. Marx challenged that and he came up with a different idea. These two ideas are in conflict with each other. Some people like Mill's idea. Some people like Marx's idea. Which idea do you like? <coughs> So this is how different people could have different truths. Third characteristic of postmodernity 
is the focus on identity. Identity. This has been a very interesting thing for me. For example, uh, growing up in various uh, private schools in the United Kingdom and Australia uh, in sort of 1980s, 1990s, um, obviously very mixed environments. Uh, I was always told by my professors, by my teachers, and by society at large to treat everybody the same, to essentially be color blind, that identity doesn't matter. That was the environment and the atmosphere in which I grew up. That was the prevailing paradigm of that time. That was the instruction given to us all. One of the things that seems to uh, be characteristic of postmodernity as we see it today is a focus on identity. So if we take traditionalism, modernity and postmodernism, in the traditional view, there was an idea that certain people were suitable for rule more than others. Now for Plato, this would be the philosopher king. For Confucius, this would be the sage king, right? Um, for patriarchal societies, this would be the man or, or the king. But there were people in society that were best suited to find the truth, discover morals, rule society. That was the traditional view. It was the right of kings. It was divine rule. That was the traditional one. Hierarchical, unfair, unjust, immoral, unegalitarian. So then we get modernism, which tries to create this flattening of that, which it says that all people are equal. So it flattens that big thing. And it says, no, we're all equal. There are no differences. And this was the view of modernism in this sociological perspective, rather than say where Stella was going with art, that regardless of race, color, gender, uh, sexual orientation, and such forth, that everybody is equal and therefore should be treated equally, have equal opportunities and identity should not be a focus. Postmodernism places the focus on identity, that one's identity does matter, that one's identity is important and that identity, diversity, uh, difference is key to knowledge, is key to discovering truths, is important to correct understanding of a society. So the way in which different uh, societies or paradigms treat the nature of identity is different, changes as it develops. And like I said, with Foucault's episteme or Thomas Kuhn's paradigms, some people, despite living physically in the world, might be in different paradigms with us reference to these ideas. The final thing here would be about the system. So we have these people, we have these values. Now, what is the system in which we inhabit? Zygmunt Bauman, who is a Polish sociologist. And now a lot of postmodernism is very difficult to read. You feel very cool and smart when you have a Foucault book on your table. It's very difficult to read. Right? You have to get through lots and lots to find a sentence. Um, Bauman's work is incredibly clear and very prescient, I would say. In 1999, he wrote the work Liquid Modernity. And he describes the system as liquid. He describes the system as liquid because there's nothing stable anymore. Like previous stable institutions such as religion or family or the state where they give you values, they tell you what to do. When problems happen, you lean on these stable institutions which provide instruction, which provide guidance, which provide direction and which help define you as people, right? who you are, that disappears. Those previously solid, hard things disappear and the world becomes liquid, moving, fluid. In that, 
Bauman says that we are required to be individuals. You are told to be an individual. You are told to be yourself. And then you ask, well, who am I? What should I be? What should I do? Just be yourself. I don't know who that is. Am I this? Am I that? What's right? What's wrong? If I make the wrong choice, will I be punished? It's very difficult existentially because previously we didn't have to answer these existential questions. It wasn't our responsibility to define who we are. It was done externally, but now it comes to us. So we can choose anything we want, but we have to choose, says Bauman. And so therefore you get things like train spotting, you get things like fight club, these kind of things where we define ourselves according to sets of material objects, our smartphone, our hair color, and such forth, that these things become our defining features. Postmodernism can be looked at by saying different truths, multiple contradictory truths can exist, which is different from previous. Identity is a key defining factor in postmodernism and different paradigms and worlds are created. If you have any questions or comments, criticisms, ideas before I move on from postmodernism and into Hallyu. Oh, okay. So what is Hallyu, Paula? That's a pretty good definition. Yeah, your name is Paula. Yeah, that's my name. Yeah, okay, sorry, I, I got very sorry, I, just, I meant to say Hallyu, but then I said Paula because that was the last name. <laughs> <laughs> what is Paula, Hallyu? <laughs> we get really dada in here, right? Okay, yeah. So Hallyu is a term that we all hear. Hallyu, of course, was first used by uh, Chinese scholars. It was picked up by Japanese people because Hallyu defines things from Korea that go overseas. That's why it's the Korean wave, right? It's the wave because it goes from here and breaks over there. Waves move, waves break in different places. So the term Hallyu was uh, brought about not by Korean scholars or Korean people, but it was about people overseas, first in China, Hong Kong. When Korean cultural products are coming over, they feel like this is a Korean wave coming at us, a wave of these cultural products coming at our society like this. Now, um, Paula mentioned some things like dramas and movies and music. So we have K-dramas, K-movies, uh, K-literature, K-pop. Do they necessarily define Korean culture or are they different? Like if you watch law school, if you get into Monster X or things like this, can you understand Korean culture? Or is K-culture different from it? Well, we might suggest that Korean culture and K-culture are different. The K in this doesn't necessarily dis stand for Korea. K-culture is primarily designed for export. Songs are made in English with English producers aimed at Western fans, or not just Western fans, but fans all around the world. Southeast Asia obviously has a huge uh, influence. The success of K-culture is often determined by overseas reception. So if it's successful overseas, then it becomes successful in Korea. This is called the boomerang effect. So South Koreans will see something becoming popular overseas and go, wow, they like that. That must be good. We'll like it too. It's this boomerang effect. They send it out, gets popular overseas, therefore then it gets popular back in Korea. So K-culture products, are their success is determined by their international success rather than their domestic success. Thus, they are hybrid for maximum appeal. They are glocalized, right? So there's this use of glocalization. There's this use of hybridity. It's not really always Korean. There's a lot of hybrid 
impure textual structures in them, in the dramas and in the music. Um, What's the Munster Rex song that I watched recently? But it was all completely in English in a very red background with hearts and colours, but it looked completely devoid of any national location, right? It was like a studio. And so a lot of K-cultural products, they make them hybrid, they make them glocalized, they remove too many cultural elements. Of course, there will be Jin's hanbok is up for sale and, uh, and these elements put in there. But for a lot of the time, K-cultural products are like this. Korean culture is slightly different. And remember, I'm trying to ask, why is it that my Korean undergraduates don't listen to K-pop and watch Korean dramas? They watch all the Western stuff. Whereas the international students in my classes, not this guy, but in my classes, they're really into it. Why is that happening? Well, Korean culture is a combination of sort of traditional Korean culture isn't really progressive. Korean culture is quite conservative, quite traditional. These are not me saying that it's derogatory or bad, but relatively, Korean culture is quite conservative, quite traditional, quite post-colonial, uh, post uh, quite nationalistic, quite ethno-nationalistic. And this is completely understandable because of its history uh, and because of its, its path of development as we've studied. But there's a difference between Korean culture and K-culture. They embrace different values, they embrace different signs, they embrace different ideas and concepts, and people perceive them differently. But this, this idea of Hallyu is not a government creation. As I said, the success of K-culture is determined by overseas success. So it's the international fans for a lot of that, that move and that push Korean culture. And this will be an important point later on when we look at authorship of Hallyu products. Right? The authorship of Hallyu products. But this slide is just trying to refute this, whole, this idea that it's a completely government created phenomenon that is manufactured and sent overseas. It's not. It's entertainment companies make awesome cultural products that people want to buy and engage and consume with. The government just kind of grabs onto the coattails of that and tries to associate itself with the success. So these entertainment companies produce amazing cultural products, some of the best music, choreography, design, dramas, movies in the world. Great cultural products. They produce it. The international fans consume it. The government tries to associate itself with those successes. So you might read a lot of that, you know, it's just manufactured, it's a government thing. I believe it's the opposite. I believe the government always tries to associate itself with the successes. The government is always quick to place itself. This is Son Heung Min winning the Asian Cup. Uh, and thus, I believe they beat Japan in the final. Winning the Asian Cup, beats Japan in the final, no longer has to do military service. This is a huge thing. Walks in, the president's in the changing room to say hello for a photo shoot. This is not a comment on the president himself, but that's the kind of thing. We need to be there at these moments of success to associate ourselves with them. And so, the government has recently, and again, this is not a political comment about this government because all governments are very similar in the way they approach this over Korean history uh, of the last 10, 15 years. The government has recently tried, uh, has recently actually created like a Ministry of Hallyu, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Education. They've created a department which will focus on Hallyu. Um, now, I've been on record of saying this is a terrible idea because old 60-year-old men in suits cannot determine what young people think is cool. I can't determine what young people think is cool. The older the me guys in suits are definitely not going to be able to determine what is cool for people around the world. 
And so therefore, it's kind of important that I would suggest the government steps back from Hallyu a little bit. The government doesn't try to position itself next to it, although it does. Now, I asked Paula to define Hallyu. Um, going through the academic literature, spend a summer reading a hundred academic papers of what is Hallyu and what all these things. And there are basically four categorizations that I've come up with. And different people categorize Hallyu different ways. They categorize K-pop different ways as well. But some people look at the development of Hallyu and they'll say we're in Hallyu 4.0. They'll point to vlogs and they'll point to beauty, YouTube videos, slow life kind of stuff happening. And they'll say we're now in Hallyu 4.0 because the focus is on style. It starts with K-dramas, Winter Sonata and all that, then goes to K-pop, becomes the driving force of it, K-culture, and finally this kind of K-style. So for some people, academics, we're in Hallyu 4.0 right now. And that will be the terminology that they use. Other people uh, look at how this wave spreads. So it starts sort of in Japan, Winter Sonata becomes huge, especially among Japanese middle-aged women. That was the primary target audience. Um, but then from there, it starts spreading to Southeast Asia. It hits North America. Now it's kind of a global thing. So when it was in this geographic region, it's Hallyu 1.0, 2. Point, starting to spread, 3.0. So some people look at the development of Hallyu as according to the geographic reach rather than the, the content which is becoming popular. Elsewhere, some have looked at sort of the, the technological developments. So when CDs and videotapes become a big thing and people can start exchanging CDs, like I remember putting my cassette, Latin and Malia. I remember putting my cassette tape in the thing and try to record the radio to hear the songs that I wanted. You didn't have access to things that you wanted back in the past. You had to get what people gave you. It's a very interesting thing. We grew up watching things that we didn't choose. I've often thought whether psychologically, you know, if you grow up always watching the things that you want and you grow up just watching what's on television, what happens to that, right? Um, CDs and videotapes come out so people can share, people can bootleg. And so this spreads Hallyu One, but this is the defining thing. Um, in 2005, I used to walk along Kwangamun or Chongno uh, to go to work, and there would be people selling uh, bootleg illegal DVDs, three or four for Manon. It changed by person to person. Sabasa. Um, but just out in the open in 2005, and you would walk past, they're selling them all there. And the police would come by. That was just it. You know, his bootlegging was out in the open then. Social media changes what's going on. So that becomes Hallyu 2.0. Finally, uh, and these are more, I'm definitely going to say Korean scholars do this. Um, the categorization four is based on the intrinsic Korean qualities. Now we looked a little bit at Han. If you've done any Korean studies, you'll know a little bit about Jong, which is like Kwangge, Bondu, this kind of intrinsic uh, connection that we have. And then it comes to Hung. Hung is this kind of, I can't even say it properly. Hung is this um, joy, fervor, excitement. Not quite passion, but more joy. Uh, and, and so some people would look at it like that. There's no consensus whether we're in any of these values. Naturally, it depends who you ask. But we define things by consensus. And this is a big, like if you ask somebody, is K-pop a genre? Some people will say yes, and some people will say no. So who's right? Well, of course I'm right. God damn it, those people are idiots. Right, okay. But normally things are defined by consensus and depending what you read you'll see that k-pop is a genre k-pop is not a genre for those people that say that k-pop defines like korean popular music well there's definite difference between these things 
They're all Korean, they're all popular, they're all musical, but they are different, aren't they? Well, if we say that they're the same, what do they have in common? Well, that they're Korean, ethnically. So is ethnicity the main sort of defining thing? Or just that it's music? But whether K-pop is a genre or not is a difficult conversation. You get things like Kati. Is Kati K-pop? Taylor? I didn't say are they good or bad. No, they're, they're, no, they're not, no, they're not. Why? Because. Because they're not Korean? No, well, no, because a lot of people also have like the New York Japanese songs. I don't think they're K-pop. BTS done three Japanese albums to date, I think. Yeah, I know, right? that's yeah. why I'm saying like Japanese, like, but that, that's not, um, personally, I don't think so. I don't really have like any information, but I personally they are mainly because what they're saying is barely true. It's not like what the thing that the word that they're trying to say is not it. Like they're not right. But I guess it is true. I say no. It's, no. it's hard, is it? Yeah, Monterey. It's I, I, <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Kachi, also from the United Kingdom. Um, there's this weird thing about Ollie London, which um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but if Ollie London was a young Vietnamese girl. Would it be different? No, I think like claiming that you're a race that you're not is just, mm. yeah, and it's like, obsession can go over the top. Like, right. There's a difference between like appreciating Korean culture and being a Korea about, and he's definitely kind of crossed the line. Yeah, I think he knows it. I think he sort of plays it out, but I guess, but yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Lana. Delete your history after. <laughs> <laughs> um, the most shocking thing about, or uh, not the most shocking thing, the thing that really separates K-pop for me than any other like pop genre that we see in the West is the way that they produce it and the way that the consumers consume it. Personally, when I was really, really into it, mm. the attraction I had was the fact that it was available 24-7. There's fan cams. They perform like a bunch of times on Ethan Gayo. Mm -hmm. Like, endless endless supplies of like just like material and media yep. and the companies are there to provide it there's fan signings like they play into it so that like connection between fan and idol is really what makes the difference between k-pop and like i guess western or just the rest of the world pop so it's the relationship it's this kind of like parasocial relationship between the fans and the idols how does that answer whether katia are k-pop or not Mm. Or not, I wouldn't consider them to be K-pop. If mm. they did, I would probably consider them to be K-pop, even though they aren't Korean and you know all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It still is. Right, so if the defining thing of K-pop, as Lana says, is if what defines it is the relationship with the fans and the consumption of these, uh, these cultural products which are produced en masse and sent out through social media, if Kachi were doing that, then they would be K-pop according to that classification. They would meet those criteria. My Korean students can't agree on whether they are or not. Right? And so therefore, what do you do in this situation? How do you answer this question? Everyone has their own impassioned answer of whether this is K-pop or not, but when you find these conflicting views amongst international fans and Korean students, how then do you come to a conclusion? Well, it depends, I guess, how you define K-pop. 
And if your definition of K-pop is based on ethnicity, production, fan relationship. This is what Jenny from Blackpink says uh, in the Blackpink documentary. I think what makes K-pop K-pop is the time we spend as a trainee. So it's not the final product of K-pop, because K-pop can sound like country. K-pop uh, can sound like hip-hop. K-pop can sound like ballads. Right? K-pop can sound like trot. K-pop can sound like anything, actually. And it does, depending what you listen to. It can sound like trap, with trap beats. But for Jenny, as an artist in Blackpink, she says, what makes K-pop K-pop is not the final product, but how you get there. That kind of relationship in the dormitory, the training, the values that you have to keep. Um, the image the lack of relationships and such forth. That's what makes K-pop K-pop for Jenny. For some other people, sugar, it's like, don't want to be defining K-pop as a genre. I'm a little bit wary of that, but I think rather than approach K-pop as a genre, a better approach would be integrated content. So not just the music, but the clothes, the makeup, the choreography, all of these. So it's a visual and auditory content package. Right? So it's not just about the music. It's not just about the process, but it's about this complete package. Pablo, Epic Eye, is K-pop? Are we K-pop or not? Well, we don't really care. What we K -pop or not. It's a big thing. But then you get this question, who gets to define what K-pop is? Who gets to define whether, like, Katy is K-pop, or this thing is K-pop, BTS is K-pop, that's a huge argument, is K-pop a genre? These things have not been answered. Everybody will believe that they have the truth, but where do we look for? So when I explain some of those elements of postmodernism, like, previously we would, have got, we would have said, well, everyone has an equal opportunity, or some people are more suited to the truth, scholars and such forth. It seems that K-pop is and isn't. K-pop is what you make of it. K-pop is a mirror. If you want to look into K-pop and see um, awesome Korean things, you can see that. If you want to look into K-pop and see progressive values, you can see that. K-pop is what you make of it. And as soon as you try to sort of put K-pop into a box, you're missing parts of it. K-pop seems to be bigger than any particular box which is a weird thing. Some people believe that the world is made up of verbs, not nouns. It's always in a process, it's always in a change. As soon as you noun something, as soon as you demarcate it with this label, then you're creating things that are not part of that. Whereas if it's verbs, it's always in a state of flux and change. I told you that in my classes, when I teach Hallyu, um, most of my students don't listen to K-pop. I see that when I, when I talk to them about music and ask them about music. Most of my Korean undergrads, they come and take a K-pop class or a Hallyu class with me. I'm like, right, so what kind of K-pop do you like? And they're like, I don't listen to K-pop, David. Like a really sort of hard way to start the class. But it's very interesting, why is that? So who are the fans? Well. First, fans are, I might come back to this idea, that's uh, Deleuze and Guattari desiring machines. Fans uh, are fans not based on economic decisions. Fans are not fans based on rational thought. Fans are people that desire something. We are built on desire. We all kind of desire different things. We're all attracted to different things, but fans desire something. It's not an economic decision which makes them like K-pop. It's not a rational decision which makes them like K-pop. It's a desire. Now, this is kind of an idea that uh, Lana was mentioning earlier with fandom. Fandom is performative. So to be a fan, you have to perform. Now, what this performative element might be these days is kind of social media. Or these days it might be, you know, you go online and you see the, the rules and guidelines that are given for fans like the Blinks or the Army and things like that, you've got to stream. 
and you know, don't turn off the sound, but plug your headphones in and don't use a playlist for the first few hours and try to do it on multiple devices. There's a performative element to being a fan. You can't just go, yeah, I kind of like it and not do anything about it. Fandom is performative. Fandom is going to the stadium. It's cheering, using the light sticks, it's wearing the shirt, buying the merchandise. Fandom is defined by action. A variety of studies have shown that men and women possess different musical listening tastes. And Colley demonstrates, for example, that women are more likely to favour chart pop music, while men on average will seek heavier alternatives. Of course, men listen to pop, I like listening to pop. And of course, women will listen to heavier alternatives as well. But if you take the averages of musical preferences, there are sometimes differences. There are differences in what all type of people. Whether it's correct to look at the difference between women and men, rather than, let's say, look at the difference between middle class and lower class, or high school educated and university educated, why that becomes the differencing factor that you account for is perhaps a different question uh, to look at. But there are differences in musical taste. Um, Young people will search out music that not only reflects their per personalities, but also the developmental issues with which they are dealing. So music kind of speaks to you. And you will notice that as you grow up, the music that you liked at 15, 16, 17, 20, like, it, it stays with you for your kind of whole life. It stayed with me, it stayed with all my friends. That music has a very um, big uh, and profound effect on people sometimes more than parents, sometimes more than religion, sometimes more than school, sometimes more than um, friendship groups. You know, you're a young kid, you've got all these problems and you start listening to this music and you're like, they're saying what I think. And if I ever die, I want this on my tombstone and I want people to listen to this song, and, right? Music becomes a thing that we associate with and it helps us deal with our lives. And this is something that uh, young people particularly do. So, fans of things, it's performative. They become prosumers, like consumers, producers, in that they're trying to navigate their own identity. So, the system tells you to be yourself, right? The answer is not written down there. It's not like there's an answer in the back of the book anymore. It used to be there were 10 rules and you follow these, well, in the Judeo-Christian thing, there are 10 rules and you follow these 10 rules and that's it. Or in another tradition, there, these are the rules, follow these rules, that's what you do. Follow these rules, you go there. If you don't follow the rules, you go there. The path was laid out. Now there is no path with an answer in the back of the book. Now it's be yourself. And say like, ah, who am I? What am I? What am I trying to do? So we have to navigate our identity. And we are concerned with our own cultural milieus. We are concerned with our own cultural environments. We all come from different places and we all have different concerns. Worries, fears, dreams, hopes and desires. And so we help construct our world through music, through cultural products. So this is the Deleuze and Guattari idea of um, desiring machines, that fans of K-pop are not characterless or identity free. They are not statistics, they are not numbers. They're not looking at things rationally or objectively. But fans from different parts of the world have different ideas about K-pop. So the fans in North America, let's say the, the, the middle class North American fans and the Southeast Asian fans, might look at K-culture and see in it different things and be fans, both be fans of that thing, but for different reasons. There was recently a study uh, done on BTS that surveyed 400,000 people. Now that's a huge sociological survey. I read so many academic articles and chapters in books and they say, we interviewed five K-pop fans. 
and they produce conclusions from that, that they then go into the academic literature and conclusions are drawn from that. This was 400,000 people. Obviously, it's not definitive. It's not every BTS fan in the world and things like that. But still, 400,000 people is a lot. I wrote to these people that did the survey and said, that, that's a huge number. Well done. Blah, blah, blah. They were very supportive. Where is ARMY from? So this is from 2020, 400,000 people. 20%, so a fifth of the fans are from Indonesia. 3.7 from South Korea. Philippines, India, Peru, Mexico, USA, Egypt. This is incredibly interesting, the, the amount of fans from Indonesia uh, compared to South Korea because the nature of the Indonesian support is never mentioned in the Korean domestic press. So for example, Rose gets to number 47 in the UK charts with On the Ground we don't listen to anything beyond the top 40. Like the, the music shows will play the top 40 and that's it. Rose getting to number 47 is like front page news in Korea. If you go onto the news portals, Daum and Neva. Successes here are never mentioned, never referenced. It's a very interesting thing because that just seems to reinforce this kind of hierarchy or this position of countries that success in one country means more than success in another country. Why is that? Why is success over here more valued than success here? Why does success here make the news but success here doesn't? That doesn't seem like it should be the way. We should be reflecting more on the reality of things and the truth of the things. Uh, in terms of the demographics, under 18, the majority. Uh, 18 to 29, 42%. So basically all very, very young as you would perhaps expect. Again, there's always a focus when I read the, the papers on, yeah, there are some old fans and there are some grandmother fans and, uh, and things like this. Yeah, great, great, great. But that always seems to be focusing on uh, the exceptions rather than the, the, the truth or reality. Uh, in terms of gender demographics as well, uh, predominantly um, young women. Of course, there are male fans, and male fans might not be, res or, or men fans, uh, but they might not be responding because of cultural pressures. Uh, they might want to sort of stay quiet or keep their, their fandom secret because of peer pressure and such forth. That, that's definitely something to account for. But when we say that the predominant consumers of um, K-pop are young girls, why is that a problem? Like, isn't that what the, the data, and the demographics suggest? Why do we not celebrate this more? Why don't we not suggest that, yeah, there's so many young Indonesian, which is kind of like where I was trying to go with that question with Ollie London and Monterey earlier, but I perhaps worded it wrong, but it's perhaps something that we should be celebrating or acknowledging rather than simply ignoring. This is the Melon uh, top 10 of the past 10 years, right? So I think I mentioned this in a, in a lecture a few, a little while ago. Um, look at that. I mean, generally Koreans listen to ballads. Korean people like to listen to soft music and they like to listen to songs. Some Korean people like to listen to songs about nature, right? Cherry Blossom, <laughs> some of these songs, right? There's often seasonal songs. And that's why they're up there, because they come out every year, absolutely. But this is the top 10. And if we take this information and combine it with like this kind of information, I find it very interesting. Um, yeah, let's do a bit more. Can we understand this idea? So this is um, Roald Barthes, Barthes, B-A-R-T-H-E-S. Um, Barthes' idea is about studium and punctum. Well, why do people like it? Why are all my international fans into it, but my South Korean students are not? Studium and punctum. Does this work as an analytical tool? 
Studium <coughs> relates to the linguistic, cultural and political interpretations of a text. Punctum denotes personal feelings created by the text. So studium is when we sort of say, yeah, in that photo there is a handbook and that's traditional Korean clothing and then there is a gat, which is a hat that symbolized class in the Joseon dynasty. And they're doing pansori, which is a type of traditional Korean singing. And they're outside Gwangbokgung, um, Gyeongbokgung, sorry, which is a, a, a palace from the Joseon dynasty, which is located in the middle of Gwangamun. And we're locating all the historic and cultural and social elements of the video. It's the information. It's the Wikipedia. And we can highlight that, and that will be true for everybody. No matter who looks at it, we can highlight that. And some people have more knowledge than others. So some people are sort of able to point it out and go, yes, this is this hat and this is this dress. And, right? Some people are better at highlighting that. But that studium doesn't change. That studium is the same for everybody. But the punctum is how it makes you feel. The punctum is how it makes you feel. Like Now you know that there's some songs that you like and your friends don't like. Is it a good song or not? Well, it's just, I don't like it, man. Or it's a movie, it's a drama, it's a dress, it's a pair of trousers. Some things speak to you, but they don't speak to other people. So why do they speak to you? Bart, in his work, uses this photo. So in, in that book, Camera Lucida, right? Did I write down the name of the book? Yeah, in this. In Bart's book, it has lots of images. This is one of them. This was a picture that Bart, when he's writing about photography, he tries to explain that for him, and it's, things don't work well blown up. For, you could look at the, the studium and you could look at the, the soldiers and, and the destruction and the war and things like him, and this, you know, and identify who they are the guns that they're using and the period of the war. But for Bart, he was like, you see those nuns back there? What are they doing? That's really interesting. It's like sometimes you, you go through a set of photos and you stop and you're that one. Why did you stop on that photo? Why is it that photo that interests you? For Bart in this one, it was the nuns. There's another one. There's studium. Is there punctum? Is there anything in photos that make you stop? It seems that for my students, this is studium and this is punctum. One they're very comfortable with, they're very familiar with. The K-pop stars or the K-dramas, the K-culture, the Hallyu seems kind of like just a different version of themselves, of their auntie, of their cousin, of their niece, and such forth, the things that they see around them. They don't stop on that. But then they see uh, a Western artist, a Western celebrity, and they stop, and there's punctum in there. For the Korean students, there's punctum in the Western images. So perhaps, therefore, conversely, when international people look at Korean culture and celebrity, they're not seeing Korean culture, they're seeing K-culture, they're seeing punctum, they're seeing something in there that makes them stop. Um, let's take a break here for coffee, let's take a break here for 15 minutes because there's still we've got things to go through. Does anybody have any questions, comments before I stop? Is your hand up? Yes, Taylor. Say it now because otherwise I'll forget where we are. Okay, and do. I was just going to say that when you're talking about like why, um, like some having like children as your main audience, like the people, like those being your supporters, why it's sometimes seen as like less impressive or less, um, not like as, as much of an achievement. I think it's, it, you can relate it to like YouTubers who have more of just like a children's fan base or a child fan base because when you see that, you're like, okay, well, you're pandering to a, a demographic who will easily like get over you or who will. Mm. You move on from you, you're only relevant for however long they're interested in whatever you're producing. So I feel like 
that might be why when you have somebody who has like a mainly child like fan base, you're kind of like, okay, well, your fame will be short lived because there are very few. Like in the YouTube example, there are very few YouTubers who have main have who have been able to maintain their child fan base for so long, unless they've they've like been able to like move with the times and move mm-hmm. with the children of life. Mm-hmm. But if you aren't able to do that, then your fan base will essentially just disintegrate once the children are like, okay, I'm over this now. So like with Rebecca Black when she made like Friday and like those songs, <laughs> like we're, I know, I know, I hate it. But like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, but like when we were young, we were like, oh my god, yeah. But then after a while, we were like, this is trash and we've moved on from it so like we don't like she wasn't able to maintain that fan base with a bunch of other people. like PewDiePie is one of the main ones who's been able to maintain that but others have fallen like with him Markiplier like other gamers like that but other ones haven't been able to do that because they've lost that momentum with their child fan base so I think that's why like it's not as impressive or as much of a success I guess you're saying so, yeah and so, but that's the focus there is on the longe- long uh, longevity of the fandom itself rather than being dismissive of the fans identity right so if you say that tra- predominantly old people prefer opera and and men like horse racing and these things just because it's um i think the point that's being trying to make there is just because maybe if it is as the research might show young women that doesn't make it something that should be dismissed of purely based on identity if you want to make a sort of Econo- I see your hand, by the way, Stella. I'm going to make an economic argument that today's army will be tomorrow's aunties, something like that. You know, that's <laughs> that's true, isn't it? Like you, you never, you don't like what music your auntie listens to. It happens, right? That would be a different thing, I guess. Is there any music that you listened to when you were young that you still think is awesome? Yeah. Are we allowed to know what? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that is actually timeless. That's why we still listen to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big fan. Stella. Mm. Mm. So do you think, therefore, I agree with what you're saying, by the way, Stella, do you think, therefore, that one thing that could happen is to celebrate the identity of the fans rather than to sort of um, try to look for examples where, oh, look, these, these boys like it, or these white... That's the way my mind goes with that particular thing. How do you feel about that idea? Yeah, the idea of sort of gender expression and soft masculinity has become a really sort of big thing here and we we all perceive it differently. Yeah, okay. Um, I've got Rebecca Black here. (laughs) Now, thank you. No, I feel like... No, that's that's your postmodern subjective truth. Um, 15 minutes and then we'll start again. Thank you very much. Three questions. So there's probably going to be a list of about six, seven or eight questions, depending on how many I make. You will choose three. That will give you about an hour for each question. That seems to me a reasonable amount of time. 
Um, when you're answering the questions, a couple of... I don't have an umbrella. When you're answering the questions, uh, a couple of things that you want to consider is this. This is something that I always find. Uh, students get to the end and then they write their personal opinion just in one sentence at the end and finish. And I'm like, that's just getting good. I'm just finally starting to hear your voice and you're saying something, but it's right at the end and then you've finished. Like, get your ideas up front, get, say something, right? So let me give you an example of three different pieces of work. Piece of work one is just all information. It's all information. It's like, yeah, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. It's essentially like an encyclopedia. It's like a Wikipedia page. It's great because all the information is correct. Now, that's pretty good. Piece of work two is just all opinion. It's just like, well, I think Korean democracy is, oh, it's this, oh, it's great, and I really like it, and I went to a coffee shop, and they were nice to me, and, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying you're going to write that, yeah, everyone's drinking Americano, and I don't know why, <laughs> and, and such forth. Now, that, that's personal, and that's honest, and you're speaking your truth, that's great, but it's missing the information. Piece of work three has information, but it also has opinion and it mixes these two. So it's not just dry information, but it's information that then is interpreted, analyzed, and something is made from it. What your interpretation or analysis might be, could be, and therefore, I don't know, it's very confusing, but that's still your final position on it. You shouldn't be aiming to produce something that is only factual or only subjective, but you've got to try to demonstrate a knowledge of the information and then interpret or analyze this information. Doesn't mean you have to come to a final answer, but you have to try to show yourself or your own ideas and work in that. So a balance of those two things I think is very important. And don't put your, don't just finish with one sentence, which is what I see too often, right? And therefore I think this, mm. um, is there anything else I need to tell you? Um, clarity of expression. There's no marks for grammar or anything like that, but is your knowledge correct? Should be, because it's open book. Is your knowledge correct? Um, do you demonstrate an understanding of our course materials and discussion? Not agree or disagree, but do you demonstrate an understanding of it? Is your work of value? When I, this is quite subjective, but when I read it, do I think like, well, yeah, here you're saying something of worth or of importance. Um, is it communicating clearly. Alexandra. Yes, and when you read the three essays, I, <coughs> sorry, is it going to be like, oh my god, is it going to be like, is it like 100 divided by three, or is it like, they're each worth, like, it's not like it's um, an accumulation of points to get like a, yay, 100, or Originally, if this was a four-hour class, there would be four questions, and it would be 25, 25, 20. But I think one hour for one question seems more logical and reasonable. So probably I'm going to give you a mark out of 100 for each question, and then divide by three on a calculator. That's how that's going to work. Um, you, you don't have to use a specific Chicago, Harvard, APA, MLA, but I would expect you to at least try to reference sometimes where your ideas are from demonstrate a knowledge of our work like you don't have to spend minutes or hours you just put brackets and you just put that's from that page on the ppt boom or put a footnote or just write something but as university students i'm sure you're all aware um reference show your references when you use them and you should be able to demonstrate the use of some references and finally don't cheat don't don't get someone else to do your work don't copy and paste from the internet i will check if I think, well, is really, did they write that? I will go and check, and if you do that, then that's not cool, right? Um, any other questions? Uh, how are you? Internet. Yeah. You can cacao Tim if you want as well. You can send a, yeah, you can do that's any of that. It's open book. So it's not about memorizing information, it's about what you do with it, right? Okay, 
Okay. How, how are the chips, Victoria? Yeah, you seem to be really <laughs> enjoying them. <laughs> no, please keep eating. It's absolutely fine. This is fine. Um, all right. So we, we've got this idea of studium and punctum from Bharat, uh, where perhaps for uh, domestic Koreans, the K culture doesn't contain any punctum, right? It doesn't contain anything that appeals to them or attracts them, makes them desire. So punctum is this subjective idea, whereas for international fans, it might speak to them. And of course, for the different international fans, for say the, the middle class fans or the fans elsewhere dealing with their own individual situations, the punctum will all be different. So when we have that uh, fans from around the world, they might all be seeing different things because their own cultural uh, identities are different. Now, we have this idea. In the current age, what makes something profitable is not the material object itself, but the idea that it provokes and manifests in the consumer. So, how does it make you feel? That's the important question. And other people can't tell you how it makes you feel. Other people can't tell you whether Kill This Love is a good song or not, or whether catchy stuff is good, whether law school or uh, startup. Law school's pretty good, right? Yeah. Um, whether these things are good or not, but it can be determined by how it makes people feel. And how it makes people feel is the really important thing. So I gave you this idea that a, a Korean studies master's student said that K-culture, not Korean culture, K-culture makes her feel liberal and progressive. Now you might argue that well, it's not really liberal and progressive, it's very traditional, it's very um, patriarchal, it's very conservative. She's like, no, but that's how that makes me feel. And that's the important thing. It's not in the object itself, but it's rather in the experience which it produces in the person. Now, if we take this as having some merit or value, and people that analyze business, consumerism and such forth also take this to have some merit or value, then what they are going to do when they produce cultural products is produce things that are as ambiguous as possible. Produce things that are able to provoke as many likely different interpretations or feelings as possible so that therefore they will have a bigger audience or fan base. For example, if it's really pointing to something, an idea, a value, uh, a, a country, then it alienates everyone else. That's why if you remove nationality from the cultural products, you get the better chance of international fans. If you remove sort of values from it, so whatever the values might be, conservatism, liberalism, progressivism, just, just be yourself. You're not actually espousing anything, whatever you want. Then it allows for greater market penetration because it allows people to find punctum in it. So the significant value is not in the text, nor in the fan's perception, but rather their perception of the text in light of an awareness of their own identity and their place in their own society. It doesn't make sense, and I'll come to this point, but it doesn't make sense to always analyze K-pop musically and say, well, this song isn't really original. This song's lyrics are a bit rubbish or, you know, this choreography isn't as sharp or bopping as the previous one. It doesn't always make sense because the value of it is not in the text, the music video or the song. It's not in there. And the value of that thing is not in the fan. The value is in the fan's perception of that thing according to their own position in society, their own awareness and their own identity. 
And now if we take these postmodern ideas, everybody's existing in a different social position and identity. We're all different, we all have to be ourselves. But that's where the value is. It's not in the thing itself. And I think that's what many people miss. So if they're dismissive of K-pop, if they're dismissive of K-dramas, then that's because they don't realize that the value could be said not to be in the text itself, but in the fans' perception of the text in light of their own place in society. What do you think, Victoria? Does this make sense? I, I, you've put your chips down now. I'm being very good. I'm saying chips and not crisps as well. Um, does this idea make sense? Do you get this, Victoria? Does, do you think that we should be looking for how these texts, these Korean cultural products, make people feel rather than in the actual text themselves? Mm -hmm. Do you know many people that listen to K-pop around you? Um, no, only like two. <laughs> 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 okay, okay, all right, very good. So this is the same argument here. So for Koreans, K-pop might appear banal. Koreans have seen a whole series of K-pop groups coming and going. You know, Big Bang was the big thing. XO was the big thing. BTS is just, just another one sometimes. I know that sounds very disrespectful to people that really like BTS, but from a Korean perspective, um, you know, it, it's not a new thing. It's just something that you see and hear every day. You go to the coffee shop, you'll hear some K-pop. You turn on the television, you'll hear some K-pop. It's just kind of always there. It's part of the background noise. But when you go to your bedroom and you put on YouTube or you put on Netflix, you can find that thing that no one else is watching. And that's the cool stuff, right? You want to have this stuff that you've found that nobody else knows about because that makes you cool. That sort of defines your identity. So when the Korean people are doing that and they have K-pop everywhere, it's not interesting for them. They want to go and find the secret stuff, which for them would be, for you perhaps, just stuff that you hear all the time. That's perhaps why now, one of the reasons why Peaches by Bieber becomes like one of the first foreign number ones in Korea because it's sort of crossing over. Also probably because Big Hit and Hybe just bought Justin Bieber and promoting him over here. The hyper-reality, you have to have a look at this word, right? The hyper-reality of K products, characterized by high production values, aesthetically perfect stars and pleasant messages, stands in stark contrast to the reality of Korean culture, which is becoming ever more influenced by gender division growing inequality and mental health issues. It's very interesting to see this, uh, this chasm grow that as Korean society uh, becomes more focused on gender and class and these kind of uh, values that we might associate with modern society or postmodern society, things which were previously not discussed, as these become more part of the daily conversation with books like Kim Ji Young, Pao Si Pin Yan Seng, and things like that, that's the reality. But the K culture is becoming more, it's becoming shinier, it's becoming glitzier, it's becoming more um, professional. So there's this dis, there's this uh, split between the reality and the thing, and the thing that is produced, these cultural products. And so Korean people experience the reality. Consumers of K-culture experience this hyper-reality. They, the, they see the Mickey Mouse doll, they don't see the people inside the Mickey Mouse doll that are sweating and working minimum wage on a 12-hour shift. There's a difference between those two things. And so, 
we have to consider the continued success of, of K cultural products and like what effect it has and whether we're pushing people into harder and harder environments to produce and satisfy the consumerist needs of people abroad. It's a very difficult thing. So, these are arguments that I've already tried to uh, point out, right? That the studium and punctum is different. But this one, this hyper-reality, I think is really interesting. This idea that what we see, and can I get back there quickly enough? This uh, thing between Korean culture and K culture. So if we're studying Korean history and culture, we learn that it's full of politics and war and death and, uh, and fighting and martyrdom and passionate struggle and these kind of things. There's none of that really in K culture. Right? There's, there's not a lot of that in K culture. Now, why? You might find that there is in movies. Movies are the very interesting thing. Movies and books. Right? For the dramas and for the music, it's predominantly K-culture. Movies are very interesting because people like Park chan and Bong Joon-ho, they do deal with class consciousness and they do deal with colonization and they do deal with uh, democracy. Because they're auteurs, they're not a production company. They're not beholden to international fans, but they're sort of Korean people making Korean movies predominantly for Koreans, I would say. Right? They're trying to speak to them. But if K-culture were to embrace some of the things that we've discussed in this class up to now, would it still be successful? Maybe to be successful, it has to remove itself from that historical subjectivity. It has to place itself in a glocalized way and appeal to everybody. It has to remove its national history. And if it does that, then... <laughs> then we'll have a look at the future of it. Um, The international fans might be experiencing their first taste of K-pop. The group is a singularity, an exquisite moment in their existence. The Alpha and Omega, the entirety of both K-pop and their own subjective life encapsulated in a group. It's this thing that speaks to them. So when they're asked to be themselves and they're asked to define who they are and consider them, they find the answers in K-pop because it's new, because it's different, because it's something else. But it's not the same thing for every fan. So for some, it might reaffirm values that are no longer found in traditional walks of life. So for middle class fans of it, K-pop might be the alternative to Cardi B. K-pop might be an alternative to uh, music that has different values in it. K-pop is the kind of thing that you can listen to with your mum or your dad, you can put on in the car and it doesn't make you feel uncomfortable. That might be what appeals to some people. For others, we sort of spoke about it briefly before. It contains a variety of masculine versatility, feminine assertiveness. It sort of produces different ideas and forms of uh, soft masculinity. Whether this goes into queer baiting or something else is a different thing, but it speaks to different international fans for different reasons because they're desiring machines who have to understand their own lives. But if this is what's happening, then what happens in the future? So in 2019, BTS make various statements saying we're never going to sing in English just to get number one. Many Koreans, by the way, don't know that BTS sing in Japanese. So we've discussed colonization and things like that. And if you ask, tell a Korean person about BTS's Japanese single, they'll go, what? It's kind of something that's not as well known here. Um, you get BTS saying we're not going to sing in English, we're not going to do that just to number one, we've got to be ourselves. And then, boom, I think Butter's out today, right? the new single, I haven't heard it yet. Um, 
but then does it does it sort of take away if the international success is what defines it and why does international success define it because the korean market is too small the korean market is not big enough to sustain it so previously it relied heavily on china now at the moment to take money from china is seen as a very bad and negative thing Previously, four or five years ago, it was all Kim Soo Hyun earns $35 million from his advertisements in China, according to his momgap, his body price. It was a big thing in all the papers, but now that's very bad. But international, these, these companies, K-Culture, will not survive without international success. But if it relies on international success, is it going to change what it is to further pursue international success? And is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? And I also wonder is if it keeps changing itself to get this international success, which is then money, then what comes back down through this funnel from Korea? So if the wave's going that way from Korea to overseas, what comes back the other way? What comes back into society inadvertently? So for example, when I mentioned that Bieber's Peaches is now uh, top of the Korean charts for the first time, have a foreign song here, which again is another interesting thing because there's this talk about Billboard number ones and Oscars and Grammys and Minari and uh, Yoon Yo Jung and the, the Western institutions are very racist but now they're finally awarding these things. Korea doesn't open its own award shows or charts up to these foreign acts. So will that open up Korean? Can it open up? Can it compete with those things? And when Bieber's now number one here and he's singing about getting my weed in California, what do the Korean people do with that? Like, there's a huge taboo subject here. Like, it depends where you're from in the world. Like, temacho? Marijuana used to grow naturally here. If you talk to people that lived here in the 1960s and 70s, you could drive to Gangwondo put your hand out the window and just grab handfuls of it. It's, it's a natural plant. It's used uh, in the countryside and things like that. If you drive around certain places, you'll still see it. But any association with that as a celebrity is just like game over over here. So what happens when those cultural products come here? It's an interesting thing to look at. We've done... The less Korean BTS are, the more popular they become. The more popular they become, the more popular K-pop comes. The K in K-pop becomes more meaningless, the more popular it becomes. There's no actual K in it. So John Lee, L-I-E, John Lee, L-I-E, wrote a 2012 article called The K in K-pop. And so this is the idea that the K in K-pop doesn't actually stand for Korea anymore because the international and the there's that international domestic thing this is something that I think is always worth addressing probably because I'm fascinated by art and music and creation and whenever you look on domestic or international news related to these things it's always about views it's never about music so if you're into sort of K-pop or something like that, when was the last time you read an article that dissected the music? It's very, very rare. So people will pull apart different songs in other genres and things like that and analyze them. But for what I've seen with these things, the, the news is just about views and it's this constant stream of hits 1 million views, hits 1.5 million views, hits 2 million views. And it's the same song and it's the same groups, but this is not news, but it, it fills this constant cycle rather than the analysis. And this is happening because they're successful and because people like them and that's great and that's a really good thing. But it's never analyzing the products themselves because the products themselves aren't important. It's just about how it makes people feel. Is that somewhere an industry should be going? And if that is true, then what happens when we get phenomenon like Sajegi? Now, Sajegi, previously with culture industries, you would have had to have got past the A&R men in huge corporations. Like if you wanted to be on TV, 
you had to get past the chairman of the channel or something like that, right? There would have been gatekeepers of industry. There would have been gatekeepers of culture that decide what gets played, performed on the TVs. But now what determines what is successful or not is simply, well, if you've got 100 million YouTube views, then you're part of it. You don't need the people in the boardrooms. If you can hit that, boom, then culture is going to recognize you, it's going to acknowledge you, and you can sort of get in that way. So it seems very like it's encouraging democratization of the culture industry, but is it really? Because, well, click farms and factories and, and, and streaming and things like that, it's, is it very, is it democratizing or is it corruption? How does this work? So we know that click factories and things like this can be bought. You can find them online if you want to boost your YouTube channels or your Insta followers or things like that. You can simply buy them. What this does as well is it reinforces the hierarchy of countries as well, because where do you predominantly buy them from? Southeast Asia or less financially developed countries. Right? Um, this is offered to, to various stars who have spoken about it. They've said, well, if you give us this amount of money, we'll guarantee you this many views and hits for your YouTube songs and things like that. So it's never about writing a good song. It's about writing a song that will get X amount of views and hits. Now, this might just be a modern thing. This might not be specific to K-pop. It might not be specific to uh, music itself. It might just be what happens on social media. But I think it's a worry for the industry because a lot of career at the moment is focused on Hallyu. Right? The government's creating an industry, a, a ministry for it. So what happens to it? Um, Elise sort of mentioned things about these Produce 101s and these shows that you get to make it seem like people are really voting for people. That it's all organic. That was proven to be untrue and the producers were sentenced to prison. None of it was true. It was all kind of false. This is an idea that I'm not sure if I can express clearly, but let's try. I would suggest that People in Western Europe, predominantly, would have different value systems from uh, people in South Korea. For example, in the United Kingdom, gay marriage has been uh, legal since 2015, I believe. The UK Embassy in South Korea promotes sort of love and equality and things like that uh, every year here in South Korea. In South Korea, there's still no anti-discrimination laws. Like South Korea is not seemingly ready to come to terms with that conversation yet. South Korea, in terms of um, gay marriage or homosexuality, things like that, it's on a different path. And there, there are reasons for that. It's own historical, cultural reasons. And this would include, this accounts not just for uh, gay marriage, but I would also include as well ideas of cultural appropriation ideas of uh, transgenderism, ideas of feminism, right? Different societies are on different paths. South Korea is on its own path and it has its own values and ideas. Um, I can't remember who it was, but I mentioned Sam Ochery um, with the... It was Paula, Lana? Lana, sorry. It was Sam Ochery who called out um, uh, Korean high school students were doing blackface. Sam Ochri was basically told to shut up, apologize, and hasn't been on television since. Right? He, he was, he's a really nice guy. I mean, he's got a lot of time for Sam. He's definitely not racist. He's got his own values. He's... Korea didn't agree with him. Right? The majority of Koreans didn't agree with him, and so he sort of disappeared from his position on the public. So we're getting this international 
versus Korean, they have different value systems, right? They're at different parts of their own development. Now, if Korea is focused on international success, then when they produce these music videos, the authorship of them is going to be determined, be determined by how international fans are going to respond to it. So, this might be a good thing, might be, but the authorship of it. So, this is a bit hard to read. The, gender, the analysis of gender fluidity in Temin's work comes from Thailand. Right, so Temin does all this kind of Michael Jackson and I really like his song, Want. Um, his work, when we talk about gender fluid, fluidity and things like that and expression, Korean people aren't talking about that in Temin's work. It's international fans predominantly because it's more uh, of importance to them. And when we talk about the iconoclasm or we talk about cultural appropriation in Hyori and Blackpink's video when international fans when I teach cultural appropriation or a lot of South Korean students don't understand the term they're like what is that it's not part of their conversation they're in a different paradigm they're in a different uh, episteme right it's not something whereas if you're in a different environment you have to be very aware of these concepts you have to be cognizant of them you have to be sensitive to them you have to try to understand them be respectful of them right as, as we go through and as we communicate with each other I certainly try to do that but for Koreans for some Korean people it's not part of that conversation they're in a different thing they've got their own ideas so when these ideas determine the production of Korean cultural products does that remove authorship from them or is it telling them that the values that they should have should South Koreans when they're making music videos be aware of cultural appropriation should they be aware of uh, Western attitudes towards these things or should they have their own ideas and attitudes towards them is authorship important or are there universal values in this does anybody have a thought on this question uh, let me go Taylor first and then Lana um, I think that especially now with how you like how popular K-pop and like Korean dramas and K culture is internationally they mm. have to be very cognizant of the things that they produce because if you want to maintain your fans if you want to maintain the fandom that you have you have to understand that there are some things especially in the United States because of the racial injustice and racial issues that we have and how mm. especially with as a black person we can say that we are the struggles that we have and like how we are approached or how our our experiences are denied and like how our feelings are denied they have to be they have to understand how their if when when they produce things that include cultural appropriation they're only adding to the difficulties that we face and it's not just our culture obviously like i know that g idol did a lot of stuff um for multiple with multiple cultures where they mm -hmm. where they culturally where they they did cultural appropriation and they didn't really apologize for it they're just like oh my bad i didn't know mm -hmm. it's like there are now like classes like cultural classes cultural um like uh what is it like being culturally aware the classes for that where where they teach that like now so you mean to the trainees yeah, and the, the idols? Trainees, yeah, 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 I've seen those. So, yeah. like, when you have those opportunities and you continue to just disregard them and make, like, put out content that is culturally appropriating other cultures, it, it's, it looks bad on you, so they have to be extremely aware of what they're doing, whether it's, like, it, it doesn't matter if it's an accident at this point. Like, you've seen many other idol groups do it, and if you're an idol group and you're like, dang, I don't want to get canceled like that, then you should, you know, be like, okay, I'm not going to do what they're doing. Right. So here's, I'll come to you in a second, Lana, just to respond to Taylor. Here's the interesting idea is whether the progressive, I don't know if progressive is the word, but the values that are, are held vis-a-vis -vis cultural appropriation and things, they seem to be common sense. They might come into South Korea through Hallyu, through 
K-pop. They might. So this is going out that way. The cultural products going out that way, but the reception and the, the fans through that might come back progressive attitudes into South Korea. That's how it might come. Does it matter if it comes from abroad rather than a, a like a cognizant awareness in in the South itself? Also. If they do, can you do a good thing for bad reasons? Can you say, well, we, like you said, we don't want to get cancelled and we want the money, so we'll do this. Like, we'll go on these training courses and we'll sit there and go, okay, so we're not allowed to um, have dreadlocks. We're not allowed to have these hairstyles anymore. So we'll do that, like, we, we, we want to do it, but we want the money. So they might not be doing it based on awareness. They might be doing it for capitalist reasons. They might be doing it for success. Does that matter, Taylor? Does, am I clear? So they're not doing it because of genuine right. cultural awareness, but they're doing it for international success. It might have a positive knock-on effect, right. but does the motivation matter? I do think that it matters because I think no matter what, if you don't have going to do these things I may not agree with what they're saying like, I, I want to do them but I'm not going to do them because I want to have the money I want to have the thing I don't want to cancel right either way I feel like so, at some point you're going to get caught up doing something because it's just if you sit through the classes and you're like I won't do that on my company's time mm. but in my own time mm. I'm going to do what I want because like it, it, it might reflect on the company but it's still my thought so there are a lot of idols who like sit through these classes but still end up posting their own opinions about like political things or political like, aspects or cultural aspects, mm. and then they get caught up and they get canceled. Mm. So I feel like you have to mean it when you do it, because if it's if it's disingenuous, somebody's gonna find out, and it's mm -hmm. not gonna look good on you or your company or the rest of your group. And like like how G friend like their person the the girl who took a picture with the Nazi statue like. She was like, oh my God, my B, haha, didn't mean to, I just didn't. But they've gone through those classes too. Like they've been around for long enough. They know they've seen other groups get like called out for that. And then she did it and she was like, I didn't hate it. Oh my gosh. Like you, you get caught up after a while. So if it's disingenuous, people are going to find out. Mm. It does matter that you mean it when you do it. Uh, yeah. Um, do you, I remember the, the, the posing for photos of the Nazi uniform and uh, yeah, we have to be, aware of these symbols do you think it's capable of changing korean society do you think that this is the the sort of k-pop industry because it's interesting to me looking at korean society the developments the democratization the values the culture whether changes might be because of the international focus on this particular industry this might be the thing that sort of twist is it capable society is like very difficult to change because of like the new Confucius values and like the older generation and how many of them there are and how, much, how many of them are in power. What are neo-Confucian values? Just to make sure I'm clear. You know what I mean. Oh. <laughs> like, I know, no, no, I know, but no, um, like the, the idea of hierarchy and having those like, like the being respectful of those who are above you in age and things like that. Right. Like having um, like the patriarchy and like different aspects okay. like that yep. that are so ingrained in Korean society and Korean culture, I feel like it's very difficult to have like this one industry change it. Even it, even though it is really big, I don't think that this, unless like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, unless like a lot of old people die off, this just not gonna. They will eventually. They That's will. what happens. But like, there's still so many of them, and like the birth rate is so low here. So I feel like even then, like it's still, and then the values are still, like even in not old people, but like people in like their 30s, their 40s, they have the the same ideals that their parents passed down to them. So it's not as if once all like 60 and above die, mm. like there aren't any more people who think like them. There are still people like that, and they'll take go into power. So I feel like until. People in our generation, maybe like the millennials and them, like once we're at the point where we can be in power, but then there will be new ideas that come in. So I feel like it's not, we won't be able, to, we, I mm. won't anyway, but mm. it's not going to be able to be changed. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, Lana? Yeah, I had a lot of comments. Um, to be honest, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> no, 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 you're good. I guess in general, there was the question of like, does the motive matter of like, if 
to these trainings or whatnot in yeah. these classes, really, like, at the end of the day, okay, yeah, capitalism is not going to matter to me because if the trainees actually sat through those classes and understood it, you either come out understanding it or not understanding it. If you mm. don't understand it, you're going to do it. If you truly understand it, then you're not going to do it, whether it's on your own time, whether it's on mm. everyone's time. I guess something of, like, the there was a topic of like mentioning like whether or not it will open up like Korean society's progressiveness. I yeah, specifically that, through Hallyu and the K pop industry, yeah. Sorry. So when we're talking about the cult, like cultural appropriation and whatnot, Korea is a homogeneous country. It makes sense that that would be the case. Mm -hmm. I can only speak towards racism because that that is cultural appropriation. Um yeah, I don't think it's a negative thing as well, like at all. I don't think that whether people here, I don't think, yeah, I guess it's very hard to say when older generations might think of it as a negative thing, mm -hmm. especially Western, you know, things that I don't think racism is a matter of like Western values. I think it's just human values. Mm -hmm. But in reality, Absolutely. I could also say the same thing of America. I don't think Korea is any different in the sense that there's older generations and anyone 60 plus in you know america probably does not understand cultural appropriation mm -hmm. just like people here don't understand mm. cultural appropriation and i think it's like the duty of people who are our age who have you know grown up in this age of globalization and we have the reach of cell phones ever since we were born to actually have an understanding of what we do no matter what it is because there's mm. no excuse uh, agreed Will it, does it matter that if, I'm just trying to explain this thing. Sorry uh, for the eyes. Um, if we have Korea here and the continuing Korean wave grows because of the economic uh, benefits that it produces, okay? So the Korean wave goes abroad, this is a wave. But because of the growing uh, thing and because of social media, and because the fans become different and the fans have different values and they project their values back in, coming back this way, then we have different attitudes towards race, towards cultural appropriation, towards sexuality and things like this. I, I do see your hands that I'm coming to you. Does it matter, Lana, do you have an opinion on whether South Korea's development vis-a-vis -vis these particular things comes from abroad or comes through the culture industry inadvertently? Well, I mean, like I was saying, Korea is a homogeneous culture. How are you going to talk about race if there's only one race in the country? Mm. You know, like, there, unless, like, there's an actual, you know, people are moving in and whatnot, I guess you could say, like, if there was more expats eventually in the country, mm. that you could still look at that to be, like, people still coming in and that yep. you know, red line that you drew. So really, like, Again, when we're talking about, like, I guess, progressiveness and whatnot, I don't really like tying any racism to that because I don't think... Like, I just it's, think it's progressive. Like, the basic, right. Like, I agree. Basic understanding. I don't think it's to do it to be a negative thing. Um, Does it matter that it comes from abroad? I don't through think the culture that's industry. The only way it could be right. Become. Something is, unfortunately, like, you, it, has, it has to be that way. Though. Right. Which is, I, I agree, by the way, of saying it's not a progressive, that thing about racism, but sort of certain things about cultural appropriation and things, these sort of concepts. It's interesting that it comes inadvertently through a culture industry that is seeking economic success. That's the kind of thing that it's not coming consciously, but it's coming um, as an unintended consequence of chasing that money. That, to me, is an interesting uh, point. Um, Stella. Can you speak a bit out of that? Thank you. Mm. 
and so with like all these like tech supported ideas or, or influence from out outside of sports supported ideas can kind of like us it's very difficult for like to make societal change because in the end it's like all of it is done for one group. And then although like on the surface you have some people who are being more aware of things, it's not like they don't have like that actual consciousness, like that they don't have a societal consciousness. Mm. What, very good, I understand everything you're saying, Stella. What comes first, the performative action or the awareness? And is it important? Is it different in sometimes? So you said that they might do the performative action, right? But if they don't have the awareness, then it doesn't matter. My question to you is, could it be that repeated performative action is what leads to awareness? That you, you do something, let me just stay here first, I, I will come. Do you understand my question here, Stella? Mm -hmm. Because before we're done, like, the purpose of it is to like, see others and not to like, you know, better yourself or to feel whatever. So like in this case, like, in this society, it's like if you're just doing it as like a thing, then it's like even though over time you get more ingrained and used to these values, it's like very difficult to like internalize them. Yeah, good. I, I, I think the word performative is, is perhaps not the way I wanted to describe it because anything performative that doesn't have substance or... or uh, you know, meaning behind it does become sort of kind of meaningless. But I guess I'm trying to think of it in the way in that we, some, we, we do things that we don't always understand. We can't control our own behavior. There's reasons why we wake up late or we, we leave our assignment till the last day or we know we shouldn't eat that thing, but we'll eat it anyway. We're never kind of in control of what we do. But that idea that repeated behavior can lead to ideational change, I think, is an interesting one. So, of course, performative political action is not always good, but on a human sort of psychological level, whether continually doing something can make us think differently. Like if you're feeling depressed, you put a, smi uh, you put a smile in your pencil, uh, you put a pencil in your lips and it creates the smile and then the physical action leads to the psychological change. Right? I guess the, I, I'm going to come to Lana first, I guess the Marxist response would be, his quote is, uh, philosophers until now have interpreted the world, the point is to change it. It's, a, it's about the praxis, the action which becomes important. Uh, Lana first and then Paula. Um, I definitely agree with what you have to say in terms of things. 
make sure they can hear you as well. Sorry, yeah. Thank you. When we're talking about K-pop, like, for example, if I was a Korean K-pop star and I culture appropriated something, I, like, let's say I did something black culture, whatever, or do that in a music video, mm. then, you know, because of this globalization and whatnot, my company forces me to put out a statement apologizing. I don't understand what it means. I don't understand. I thought, I think it's fine or whatnot, but in mm. the statement, I say I apologize for doing this, this is disrespectful to the black community, blah, 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 this, this, and that, and I put it out, you know, I might not care, but like, it's also, okay, you're in a position of power, mm -hmm. now you're telling, you're apologizing and whatnot, all that kind of stuff. You may continue to do it, or whatever it may be, but like, eventually you'll see more and more people also doing the same things, and an attitude changing, and then, you know, quickly you realize, wait, why am I the only one who thinks this way? Like, this is acceptable. It's when everyone is saying that it's unacceptable. Mm. And that causes, like, kind of like a self like analysis. Like, why am I thinking this way? You do your own research and whatnot. And honestly, like, I, again, I don't think Korea is that unique in the sense that America also went through the same stuff. Mm -hmm. It was not that, you know, wasn't that far back. I'm pretty sure, like, for the biggest thing that I can remember was. <coughs> 2013, where, like Miley Cyrus went crazy per se, and like you know, all of a sudden there was a whole display of like black culture and people like got on her. That was the first time I really saw people get on somebody for cultural appropriation. It's never happened before, and I'm sure like you know she apologized once and then she continued mm. doing it. But slowly and slowly, like people realized that oh wait we have power in terms of like this saying this is wrong, and generally like now the public. I guess when we're talking about entertainment or whatnot, in the, like in the West, it's completely changed where like, mm. there's certain things that are unacceptable to do. Mm. And to be quite honest, if you can read a statement, and the statement's a good statement where it says, it's disrespectful for X, Y, and Z reasons, and you still don't understand why, that's on you, man. Like, right. there's, there's nothing I can say from there, there on. Like, I, I really don't know. You gave the example of... Um do right like people wearing certain things that might be considered cultural appropriation um <clears throat> recent example that kind of made me double take was adele at a festival i don't know if you saw that one oh, yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> i don't know if i'm allowed to say the comment that i saw underneath but it was it was amazing no i won't do it um <clears throat> if My question would be this, um, and I will come to you, I want to go to Paula, but in terms of authorship of ideas and things like this, and I won't stay on it long, I want to go to Paula, is that when you go to Gyeongbok Palace, Koreans like you to wear hanbok. They want you to wear their clothes, they want you to wear their culture. When my brother comes over with his fiancée from Nepal, they're like, get on the hanboks, let's go to the, the, the Hanok village, and Koreans are like, wow, look at this, you look so good in the hanboks, can we take photos with you, and things like that. That's a very different attitude towards that, right? And, and there, there will be reasons for that, but that's generally, is it because they want to elevate their own culture by having foreigners adopt it, so it seems to raise it? That's a very different thing, and that, I think that's one of the reasons why it's been hard to communicate this idea to some students. I, I want to give Paula a chance, uh, please. I was actually going to mention that a little bit because I thought, like, that's something that I thought about before. Right. Like, we visited Gumbuka Palace and, like, that was something that was on my mind. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, is it okay for me to put on this outfit, like this hanbok, that is not from a part of my culture? And mm. I came to the conclusion for myself not saying, like, if anybody decided to do it or not to do it, not putting them on you. Um, I think it's like a decision within myself, but I thought the same thing of like, I'm in South Korea, a Korean woman is putting this on me, I'm supporting a local Korean business, like, they invite you to do this, and I think the difference is that, like, it comes from, like, a respect, like, and I think that a lot of the times when, like, 
like K-pop performers are doing things and their international fans say like this is cultural appropriation, this is hurtful, mm. and then you continue to do that, that shows that you don't respect it. And I think like a lot of people are talking about like understanding things and like why they're hurtful and I think that for for me and my own personal development as a human being, mm-hmm. I've come to realize that there are some things that I just like will never understand because I am not such as what? I'm curious. What what things I think the the one that comes to mind uh, most personally is I think especially going to like Wellesley College, which is like a historical women's college, one of the things that I personally had never been exposed to was like the idea of like pronouns and like how people might use pronouns that aren't he, his or like mm-hmm. hers. And I feel like that was something that like going to Wellesley was like very eye opening to me and that's still something that I think I personally don't fully understand, but I still have enough respect for somebody. Like when they tell me mm-hmm. that they use other pronouns, like they say like my pronouns are they them or something like that. I respect you. I will use those. Even if me personally, it's hard for me to understand why mm-hmm. I still respect them. And I think the same thing for like K-pop fans. And I'm still on a journey to try to understand it, but I know that I will never fully understand it because I don't identify with non-binary. Sure. You know? And so... That's my own personal take on it. I'm sure like other people have a lot of other different right. opinions and I'm, I'm like super down to talk about all those things. But the handbook thing is an interesting thing because it, it, it's very different. And so this idea of authorship and, and what controls it, if they have their own ideas and values here about it's okay to, for other people to wear their culture. So they're like, why can't I do that? Because you can do it here. It's an interesting conversation. I want to give Elise a chance, if that's okay, Lana, because she had her hand up. I'll come back to you. I was also just about to bring that up. <laughs> I read your mind. It's not an individual thought. It comes down and spreads. Yeah, and, um, I don't, yeah, I think it's quite interesting I'm not sure that I fully understood your question. If you try one more time, I'm sorry, just to make sure I understand like, it. If, yeah. if people become more aware of like, um, that they shouldn't cultural, like, culturally appropriate other cultures here in yep. Korea, that like, I don't know, like overseas when like other people like appropriate Korean culture, that they'll start to have like, be like, oh, you can't do that. Like, that's disrespectful. Would it be appropriating if it's offered? So the idea of cultural appropriation, is, is, there are many definitions of it, okay? But the idea that you're taking someone else's culture and using it, perhaps even commodifying it, and then benefiting from it and doing it disrespectfully. Um, and often there's a power dynamic in there. But what if the Korean people or some Korean people are offering their culture to be used? 
So when you go to Gyeongbukgung, uh, when you go to those palaces, it is offered to you as a service, uh, not only as a service in a capitalist industry, but also as a sign of sort of cultural, like fun and joy. Put on the this, take a photo, and it'll be good. And, and, and that's how a lot of Korean government promote tourism. Let's put foreigners in hanbok and take photos, and that will be the way that we promote Korea. So if, it, if, if it's off, like <clears throat> there's stealing and there's giving something to someone. So I would say if it's being offered genuinely, like, and without economic or psychological coercion, then perhaps it's not cultural appropriation. Mm. My culture is not your prom dress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then she would think some kind of like really sus poses, you know, for a prom picture. And and like all the Asian American people were like, wait a minute, <laughs> like you can't do that. And then like I like they were like I don't I remember like going on like YouTube and then like all the comments like like the like the, the like in, like I don't know, Chinese nationals were like, we don't care. Like I don't know. I, I wanna give Lana and then Stella and then Anita a very quick chance and then we have to kind of... I'm going to just say my comment quickly because you kind of already mentioned it where it's uh. like, oh, just because it's offered doesn't necessarily... Like, I guess I want to emphasize that just because a culture is offered at the hands of the people who have, you know, that culture doesn't necessarily mean it's okay because, and I guess go into depth about like the economic thing that you're saying. Like, for example, people go to Caribbean like Jamaica all the time and then get box braids done and whatnot. Like, mm. I remember elementary school, I'll like go to that mm. or like my school come and back. Be like, okay, we just let you know. Um, but in reality, when you're looking at a country and most of their money comes from tourism and all that kind of stuff, and you don't actually engage in like understanding how that affects the country, and especially in like the Caribbean, there's a lot of racism in that too, where that those are the only jobs that they could even have. Mm. So it's really like their livelihoods were just changed because of people like you coming in you know, fake saying, I want to enjoy your culture, but not wanting to understand everything about it. Yeah, you, they can offer, they're offering it to you, but what does it really mean? Like, is there actually something that you should engage in? And the answer is no, you should not be engaging in that. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, I guess Korea is a little different. Personally, I didn't uh, wear the hanbok because I still think that, like, I honestly don't understand it and whatnot. And I just, I think it, it was just my thing. But um, yeah, I guess that, that example of, especially just, I guess throughout Africa, we have a lot of people who come in and a lot of things are like offered, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's okay to do mm -hmm. them. Mm. And then like, I think a whole another part of like cultural appropriation where it, it goes to the next level is like you were saying, commodifying it. Like that's where it's like a no. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the people who actually have the culture should be using it just because they said that's okay is not, it's still not. Yeah, that's a question. If you do it, say, for example, at home and nobody saw it and you just did it or you did it in the public eye and profited it for like a, a new release or something, is that a different action when it is commodified uh, in that sense? I guess one of the things that you all should consider as well is a definition of culture. Like if you were asked on a test today in 10 minutes, define culture, how would you define it and could you define it? Uh, because we're talking about cultural appropriation and changing cultures. What is that thing called culture? It's a very difficult thing. I give you lots of ideas about it. Uh, Anita? Like, 
they were happy that someone was wearing it because like they're I guess like [noise] for Chinese people, like, it's uh I don't know how to word this right, but like as long as someone like recognizes Chinese culture, they're happy. They don't care if it's like used to insult Chinese culture as long as like Mhm. they're wearing something, like I feel like they feel really happy about it. Mhm. And so maybe it's like the mindset that's different? [noise] Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Cuz like for me, like, I like the fact that they're wearing like Chinese shirts. Mhm. [noise] And I don't like the fact that it's like they're so racist against other people. Mhm. Like, you would think that they would be against you because Chinese people wear such dark clothing. Yeah. But the reason why I like it is because it shows, like, the people of Chinese culture and like how they treat other people. Mhm. Like I don't like people wearing like [noise] Dark skin, like [noise] Well, I don't like people wearing, like, you know, white shirts and [noise] Mhm. [noise] Like one piece. No, I don't like that color. I don't like that color. Yeah, I think it's the color. It's just the fact that it's different. I don't like other colors. Yeah, I don't like that color either. Yeah, I like the fact that it's different. Yeah. Mhm. [noise] But I guess, like, if you're going to be like that and you're wearing shirts that are like [noise] [laughs] Mhm. [noise] Yeah. I think it's the color though. [noise] Yeah. Anyways, it was just an interesting uh story. Yeah. Yeah. That was more fun. Yeah. [noise] Cute. [inaudible 1:05:49.50] [noise] Yeah. Yeah. [noise] All right. Thank you. Yeah. Was that fun? Yeah. Yeah. [noise] I haven't been able to go since. Yeah. Been a while. [noise] Yeah, I like, I haven't been out since I went back. Yeah. I miss that movie. Yeah, it's good. Yeah.